I'd like to introduce John Ferber. John Ferber is the CEO and founder of Legendary Pharmaceuticals. He is an entrepreneur and scientist who has been studying the biology of aging and regeneration for more than 20 years. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Physics and Mathematics from the University of California at Santa Cruz in 1975, a Master of Science degree in Biological Sciences from the University of California at Irvine in 1990. Between degrees, he served the United States Congress as a technology policy analyst in the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment. Mr. Ferber was a principal in starting five companies during the 1980s and 90s. Currently, he is running a biotechnology call, company called Legendary Pharmaceuticals, which is engaged in the discovery of pharmaceutical drugs and gene therapies able to repair and reverse accumulating molecular damage to subcellular myochondria, lipsomas, nuclei, and extracellular proteins in order to prevent and treat serious late onset diseases commonly associated with aging. I'll let him tell you more about what he's doing. Let's give him a big hand, John Ferber. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, can everybody see the screen okay? Okay, I'm going to... I'm going to talk with you uh, tonight about. Sorry about the sound. I can't get it about it. Is it a loose connection? It's. I don't know what it is. Sorry. I'll just talk. It's old equipment. Hopefully you can hear. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to talk about um, a molecule that's called lipofuscin, lipofusin, lipofusin, lipofusin. Different people call it different things. It's basically junk inside the cell in a particular part of the cell called the um, lysosome. Now the lysosome is found in every cell and it is the recycling center in the cell. Is it at this end or at your end? It's the sample part. It's older than the SLF. I no, it's not at the mic, it's at his um, amplifier. Okay, we can hear it. Okay, good. Um, so, there's a lot going on in aging, and in, as I studied aging, I, I developed a flow chart, which some of you have seen as a big wall chart, and some of you have seen on the web. Um, it's the systems biology of human aging, and I guess I could have cut out a laser pointer. Okay, we'll forget the point. If you look at this thing, uh, the top area is um, molecules inside the cell and, and that get old with age. The middle section is how the cells respond to that, and the bottom section is diseases of aging. Anyway, analyzing that, we find that there are several parallel processes that um, take place in our bodies as we get older. Is it easier if I just don't use the mic? Yes. 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 Talk about that. Sorry. Those of you that are hard of hearing, please come up close. Can the people who are looking here? Probably not. So maybe my phone's good for the people that are live streaming. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll hang on to it. <laughs> um, so uh, we've got um, things happening outside of the cells. We call that extracellular. And we're most familiar with uh, molecules like collagen that hold our bodies together. Without collagen, we'd be a bucket of cells on the floor. Um, collagen as it gets older, it gets stiffer. This causes high blood pressure, pressure causes uh, problems with uh, kidneys, even wrinkled skin. Um, there are also things that accumulate inside the cells, as I mentioned. Lipofuscin inside the lysosomes. There are problems with the mitochondria, problems with uh, 
molecules that are attacked by free radicals. Uh, there's um, decline in protein production when the ribosomes are um, damaged and not replaced. There's changes in the DNA. There's changes in the proteins holding the DNA, the chromatin. Uh, the nuclear envelope that surrounds the DNA starts to deteriorate. And um, the cells start um, dying off and stem cells stop dividing to replace them <coughs> and we get inflammatory cascades. Now, what I'm gonna propose tonight is that many of these things could be fixed if we could get rid of the lipoplasin. Um, in this cell culture experiment, we see on the left, uh, some fluorescent molecules of lipoplasin in young cells, and next to them on the right, a lot more fluorescent molecules of lipoplasin in aged cells. And uh, this uh, is visual proof that indeed um, more and more of it accumulates, at least in cells that don't divide. Now the main cells that don't divide are the cells of the brain and the heart. How am I sounding in the back? Can you hear? Okay. Uh, cells that divide, every time they go through mitosis, they dilute the lipoplasin between the two daughter cells, and also some of the lipoplasin seems to fall out in the process of cell division. So this is primarily a problem with cells that don't divide. And this is, um, this causes consequences of aging because not only do we have aging of brain and heart, but we have an aging of cells which could divide but normally don't, such as fibroblasts. Now, fibroblasts are the cells involved in wound healing and in repairing the extracellular matrix. And if, uh, if there is no wound, they don't divide, so they age just like the brain cells and the heart cells. And uh, in cases like that, they accumulate lipoplasin also. And uh, with the accumulated lipoplasin, they no longer turn over the extracellular matrix as well. They no longer heal wounds as well. And uh, this is uh, another primary cause of aging. So um, by fixing the lipoplasin problem, we can um, consequently fix problems with free radicals, mitochondria, telomeres, the protein production, the intracellular aggregates, the extracellular matrix deterioration, the genomic aging, and the stem cells. This is a... Um, Let's see if this works. Oh, that's John, much nicer. Yeah? The pub, it's going on and off. Are you holding something or not? No, it's at this end. So hopefully this web stream is not happening. That's just the house PA. And with, and, Okay, no. are, are you going out okay on the web? I have no idea. Okay. It's, it's whatever we hear here is going on the web. Everything? Everything you hear on is going on the web. Yeah. On the micro, whatever we hear through the microphone is going on the web. So when it crackles, it goes out on the web. That's what we got. Uh, hey, John. Yes. I suspect there might be an RF problem and you're shielding it by standing with what the microphone no, it, sorry folks, this uh, sound system is older than the smart life form itself and it's, it's pretty much on its last legs and so I apologize for not having it serviced properly. You're holding the other hand. It's this way, not that new microphone. I will prove him wrong. See, now it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Okay, in this picture here we have um, uh, a picture of the digestive sac, the lysosome, and we see uh, cytosolic proteins that have been marked for destruction and being imported into the lysosome. We see also the lysosome is the first digestive organelle inside the cell when the cell decides to come out from the outside. And finally, when the cell um, is recycling worn out mitochondria, it forms a membrane around them called the autophagosome and uh, the autophagosome merges with the lysosome and uh, everything inside the lysosome gets digested because the lysosome is a bag of digestive enzymes. Um, and a Should we ask questions during the lecture or afterwards? That's a question. <laughs> <laughs>
later, okay. Um, for those of you that might harken back to your days in uh, biology class, this is uh, the parts of an animal cell. The mitochondrion is the power plant in the cell. It converts sugar and fats into ATP energy. Um, the membrane that goes around the cell is called the plasma membrane. Um, the nucleus in the center of the cell contains chromatin, which contains DNA, which contains genes. And um, the chromatin itself, uh, the nuclear envelope, is what separates the nucleus from the rest of the cell. Um, we have the Golgi complex that makes proteins, uh, that transports proteins that are made uh, either in the rough ER or in the ribosomes. And here's that recycling center, the lysosome. And we have cytoskeletal fibers such as uh, microtubules, actin, and so forth. Um, all of these things gradually wear out with age, but as they wear out, they get digested in the lysosome and the cell makes new ones. Now the problem, and that's done by that process I described earlier called autophagy or autophagy. The problem is when the lysosome gets filled with stuff that it can't digest, it stops digesting and then autophagy goes downhill and we no longer are able to recycle the other components of the cell. This is a view of the lysosome. Uh, it has a membrane that separates it from the rest of the cell's cytoplasm so that the digestive enzymes don't attack uh, the rest of the cell's components and cause damage. Um, we call these enzymes hydrolytic enzymes because they uh, take water out of they put water and then take water out as they uh, do their chemical reactions.
and lamin A gets damaged by oxidative stress, and when it does, it prevents stem cells from dividing. Now, autophagy can nibble off pieces of this, which then gets replaced, and if there's damaged lamin A in here, it gets digested in the lysosome after the autophagosome moves it over to the lysosome. If there is um, no lysosomal activity, then the autophagosome can't accept anything, and we get an accumulation of lamin A in the nuclear envelope, and the stem cells can't divide anymore. And this is a, a picture of the telomeres, and this is a little bit speculative. We know that telomeres are very important for stem cells to continue dividing. <coughs> That's why the enzyme telomerase is important. Um, and it appears that by um, maintaining proper cell functioning, we can also maintain the telomeres. Um, I'm not going to say too much more about that because my focus right now is on lipoplasm. This is the extracellular matrix that I've mentioned several times. These are the, uh, the collagen fibers that act as strong um, ropes that tie our cells together so we're not a bucket of cells, um, but we're actually able to stand up straight. Um, and then we have elastic fibers which um, give elasticity to our uh, arteries and other tissues. And then of course there's other things like uh, capillaries, blood vessels, fat cells, and so forth. And there's immune the cells crawling around yeah. all in between. Now, this is an example of um, elastin, the elastic fibers of the aorta. If you took a cross section out of the pipe coming out of your heart, which is called the aorta, and then dissolved away all the cells, there would be all of this elastin left. And as long as the elastin is elastic, every time the heart pumps, it's, the um, aorta stretches a little bit and acts like a shock absorber. And, um, when the elastin gets stiffer with age, um, the shock absorber action doesn't happen. It's more like a steel pipe. And this allows a pressure pulse to go all the way into the brain and can cause a stroke. So maintaining elasticity is uh, how, we, how we notice that young people have lower blood pressure than older people. And uh, so there are a couple of um, research uh, tacks that are, are um, working to take care of this problem, and one of them is drugs that would restore elasticity to the elastin directly, and the other is if we can keep the, glycos, the fibroblasts healthy, the fibroblasts will actually gradually replace the old elastin with new elastin. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm saying that this is another thing that could be fixed by fixing the lipofussin problem because <coughs> lipofussin accumulation is one of the things that causes the fibroblasts to stop doing their job as well. The fibroblasts have to digest the old elastin inside their lysosomes in order for them to then have room to put out new elastin to replace it. Um, I mentioned the powerhouse of the cell, the mitochondria, and you can see how the, uh, the young mitochondria are putting out a lot of energy. This is based on a, a chemical diet that indicates how much ATP they're making, and the old mitochondria um, have much less potential because they're using this low energy and resonance high energy in this particular experiment. So we actually are getting ready to start a research project um, to test some molecules that we believe will get rid of the lipofuscin. And uh, I've been uh, in the Bay Area this week talking with a couple of laboratories about setting up cell cultures so that we can grow the cells up and um, grow them under very oxidative conditions that will cause them to accumulate lipofuscin in a much shorter time than the whole lifetime actually in a few weeks, and this will give us an assay so that we can then test our drugs and after we make them accumulate this lipofuscin, then we'll have um, a 
each of the drugs that we're testing, we'll see which ones get rid of the lipoplasm. And uh, we're very um, optimistic at this point that we will have some early success and uh, we can then uh, start seeing if we can make really healthy mice. And after we make really healthy mice, we'll see what other small animals we can make healthy, like cats and dogs, and eventually we'll find some brave people who want to be really healthy too. And uh, the way the <coughs> development process goes after you make really healthy mice and cats and dogs, then you um, go out to a, a venture capital or pharmaceutical company partners and get enough money to do tests on people. And that's what all of this is. These are just the initials that stand for all the regulatory tests that have to be done before you can go to your local um, drugstore and get a doctor's prescription and um, buy a therapy or whatever uh, ailment might be suitably treated by this. I have, I'd like to thank some of the people that have over the years volunteered their time on our scientific advisory board. And um, I want to, uh, Mike, how much time do you want me to take? Okay, I'm just going to um, take a little bit of time to show you a little more detail about this chart that I drew in. Um, some of you have actually seen the paper chart and some of you have seen this on the web, but um, in this view I can expand things and let me see some details so that, oh, I know what I should show you first. Yeah. This is, um, this is where you get it on my website, legendarypharma.com. <clears throat> if you go to my website and go down here, it says Network Flowchart Systems Biology and Aging. If you click on that link, uh, you'll actually be taken to a web page here where you'll find the chart in its full size, <coughs> which you can look at on your computer. And if you feel so motivated as to want to have it on your wall, you go down below that picture and there's a PDF that you can download. You can uh, either order prints already printed and I'll send it to you in a rolled up tube. Or you can um, download here and the uh, background information is here. Can you see that little hand moving back and forth? Mm -hmm. And uh, you can then go to Office Max or your favorite printer, <coughs> have them printed out four feet wide and five feet tall. <laughs> and uh, it's the perfect Christmas gift. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm asking a small donation if you print it yourself or you can uh, have me send you the rolled up poster, but it's probably faster to. The best office max in the area that I found is uh, the one on uh, Geary, no, Geary, Lombard Street or Geary Street. Anyway, North San Francisco. Um, the big office max there you can do it in a couple of hours at uh, a pretty reasonable price. Um, so that's where to get it if you want it. I wanted to show you a little bit about how it's organized. So there are these boxes that represent the lysosome and the nucleus and the mitochondria and all of these things. And inside of them are boxes of text saying what's going on and there's arrows showing how one thing leads to another. And if there's an X at the end of the arrow, it means that this thing leads to inhibiting this thing. And if there's no X, it just means this thing leads to this. And if it's a skinny arrow, it means this leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. If it's a fat arrow, it means there's actually some molecules moving around to make the thing happen. And finally, you see some of the boxes are nice and square, and some of the boxes have slanted roofs. And these slanted roofs, I got this idea from looking at stock market charts. And we're interested in aging. And what's aging? It's the difference between a young person and an old person. So if your lysosomal activity is going down with age, I made a stock market chart that went down. like your portfolio a couple of years ago. <laughs> and uh, if it's something that goes up with age, um, I made a, a box that goes up, like portfolio 10 years ago. 
Um, now, in most cases, these are long-term changes. I'm not looking at changes that happen every time you eat a meal. I'm not interested in, in you know, the insulin that's released five minutes after you eat an ice cream cone. I'm interested in what's the difference between uh, a level at age 20 and a level at age 60. So that's this, this is looking at very long-term changes. And um, I, you'll also notice in these boxes there are some code numbers. And eventually, I'm going to um, have some graduate students or interested scientists start to um, build a wiki page where each code number will have a bunch of references to the scientific literature so that you're not just taking my short abbreviation, but maybe there will be a paragraph or a whole page on each of these boxes along with references to back it all up. So this is definitely a work in progress. Um, the version that's on the web now was revised as of last August. I'm working on another revision that should be out in another week or two. And about twice a year, I, I add some changes as I learn new things. So I, I consider it a, a work in progress, and hopefully it's going to become a community work in progress at some point. So I've told you a little bit about um, lycoplasin and lysosomes and the cell biology of aging and how um, getting rid of lycoplasin could uh, potentially help us to age more healthily, keeping our brains and our hearts intact. And I've told you a little bit about um, this flow chart um, that uh, uh, illustrates what occurs during aging. When you get down below the stuff inside the cells, you cross this tan line, you look at what happens to whole populations of cells inside our bodies, different tissues how they change differentiation, or they start to die off, or they proliferate too much. And that cause, you cross this pink line, and you get the diseases of aging, everything from cancer and osteoarthritis, to pulmonary emphysema and COPD, <coughs> macular degeneration, blindness, all of these things. So you can actually spend quite a lot of time contemplating this chart and using it as a jumping off place to study various aspects of aging. If you're really serious, I suggest you get um, one of the college textbooks, such as the very thick and authoritative Molecular Biology of Aging, fifth edition, by Bruce Alberts and his gang. And uh, that's really the way to find out what's going on um, in the molecular biology of the cell. And uh, so much of aging is involved in that. And uh, so much of what you see in this chart could be expanded upon by reading that. But I really recommend that as a, a book to pick up. Um, I think I'm going to stop here and uh, are there any questions? Uh, yes. Um, would fasting play a role in this? Yes. <laughs> Your name's not John. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, fasting is important because it, <laughs> fasting is important because it upregulates the autophagy. It uh, stimulates this turnover process. But once again, once the lysosomes are completely clogged up, fasting won't do as much for you, although it might help to slightly unclog things. We're looking at developing a drug that will speed up that process. But uh, uh, some people recommend a, a daily partial day fasting, such as skipping every breakfast or skipping every breakfast and lunch or skipping every dinner but eating breakfast or something like that. In other words, mm -hmm. eating all your food within five day, five hours of the 24 hour period, which lets your body get quite depleted of food for 20 hours, which uh, seems to be quite healthy. Other people will do a, a fast once a week. It depends a lot on what you can tolerate. Exercise is another thing that works very much like fast. Uh, we were next. Yeah. What is the chemical structure of the perfusion and what chemical strategies are you taking in your drug development? Ah, that's a very good question. Uh, she asked, what is the chemical structure of this lipobuscan? And what is the strategy that we plan to approach in our drug development? So the lipobuscan uh, could be likened to um, melted plastic. It's not, it's not a crystal, it's not a small molecule, it's a three-dimensional cross-linked clump 
made from pieces of proteins and pieces of partially digested uh, lipid membranes. And when they get oxidatively modified, uh, primarily by free radicals created by excess iron in the lysosome, um, they get groups that a biochemist would call an aldehyde group on them. And aldehydes are very reactive, and it causes them to bond to the nearest thing they come, come in contact with. Now, the lysosome has all these hydrolytic enzymes for taking apart regular proteins and taking apart regular lipid membranes. But once you get these aldehyde groups forming weird bonds, the bond angles are wrong for the catalytic sites and the enzymes, and the enzymes are not very effective at taking them apart. And as a result, you get a gradual adding on. It's as though you've got a bunch of, of pieces of wood or metal stuck with glue, and gradually they stick to each other and they build up, and then you get some iron incorporated in it. And every iron atom acts as another source of free radicals, causing more of these aldehyde groups to be um, formed on the partially digested proteins and lipids. So that over time, the mass gets bigger and bigger and harder and harder to digest. The exact um, strategy that we are looking at in our drug development is uh, something that I can't talk about right now. We are planning to file a patent for it fairly soon. Um, but it's a very good one. If you want to fund him, he's looking for funding, and you guys can be on his first list for trying the drug before the mice. Is there another question? <laughs> uh, yes. I was wondering if the if you've done any thoughts about L arginine as far as relaxing the whatever it is in the aorta that makes it hard. Uh, okay, well um there are a number of strategies that have been used over the years to lower blood pressure. And in most cases, if you go to if you go to a doctor, if you've got your own blood pressure cuff, blood pressure always comes as two numbers. There's the systolic number, the high number, and the diastolic number, the low number. So one is the pressure while the heart is squeezing, and the other is the pressure while the heart is refilling and relaxing. And most conventional blood pressure drugs, including those that are nitric oxide effectors and so forth, they cause the vessels of all of the, um, they cause the walls of the blood vessels to relax. So there's more volume, so with more volume, it's less squeezed and the blood pressure goes down, um, the problem is that it can cause fainting because the low number goes down as well as the high number. But that's not really anti-aging. That's, that's doing something instantaneously. What I'm talking about is the fact that a young person has very elastic arteries and an old person has very stiff arteries. And just causing them to relax a bit doesn't make them more elastic like a shock absorber. <coughs> so we actually want to rejuvenate the system and not just tweak it a little bit with, a, with one or another um, uh, blood pressure lower that will lower both numbers and might cause fainting. Yes? If the cells stay alkaline, how does that affect their health? Does that then keep them in a healthy state, which is sort of anti-aging or keep them functional? There is um, there is a whole cult of alkalinity. There's a whole cult of alkalinity, but if you read the standard physiological textbooks like Guyton, um, you'll see that our bodies have something called homeostasis. And they maintain the pH of the blood at a certain level. They maintain the pH of the inside of the cell at a certain level. They maintain the inside of the lysosome at a certain level. And this is done by molecular proton pumps. And if the pH of any of those levels changes too much, you're dead. And so um, I don't really subscribe to the cult of alkalinity. No. Uh, other questions? Yeah. The uh, author of that book, Molecular Biology of Aging? I'm you? sorry, it was Molecular Biology of the Cell. I misstated. Oh, okay. Uh, it's uh, The latest edition is the fifth edition. Uh, the first author is Bruce Alberts. Thank you. And there's like five or six other authors as well. The, uh, the reference edition has, it's about three inches thick. <laughs> and, 
and it's like $200 on Amazon. The student edition is two and a half inches thick, and it's only $130 on Amazon. But it's a really good book. Yes. Walter? Does the cell generate new lysosomes, or do you just get as many as you want as the cell is born with? Uh, good question. The cell is generating new lysosomes all the time. But the problem is, in these old heart and brain cells that aren't dividing, it gets filled up with a lot of, of these clogged lysosomes, so that when it starts to make new lysosomes, a lot of the enzymes go to the old clogged ones, and hardly any of the uh, enzymes go to the new, new ones. And so the cell gets very confused, and, and the whole, you can think of the lysosomal system of there might be 100 or 200 of these little lysosomes throughout the cell, but if 180 of them are um, clogged up, you're going to have a very inefficient turnover. And, and um, if all of them were clogged up, the cell would die pretty quickly. So when, when you've got a small fraction of effective lysosomes, it's keeping the cell alive, but just barely. Yeah? I may not get my question right, but I'm Correct, but I'll, I'll try to see if I can kind of sum up. So what I understood you to say is that um, there are two or one ways that you can um, deplete the lysosome of ly lipofusin, and that is cell division. And what was the other way? Uh, okay, normally the reason that dividing cells don't have this problem is that when they divide, half of the lipofuscin loaded lysosomes go to one daughter cell and half goes to the other and then both daughter cells grow and there's a lot of extra space in there. The other thing is we believe, and this isn't quite um, proven, but it's very plausible that during the cell division process, some of the lipofuscin loaded lysosomes um, end up in the extracellular space between the two dividing cells. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so between dividing cells, it doesn't build up. Correct. So it's a mainly a problem in the non-dividing cells. Either the, the brain neurons and the heart muscle, which never divide, or some cells which are important, the but they only divide infrequently, like fibroblasts mm -hmm. and some stem cells, which only seem to divide once in a while in response to the need to replace something. So, so, so my question is about the comprehensive um, uh, effort to um, delay aging. Um, and I can hear that it would help heart and brain cells, but it must be these fibroblasts and other cells that you're talking about that um, then affect the body systemically in terms of, because I mean, obviously other parts of my body are aging, right? That's right, yes. So I think the fibroblasts are very important, um, but I think having all your brain cells is important too, and having a strong, healthy heart is important, so. But, but, but I guess one of my questions is, is how does, um, cleaning out or preventing lipo uh, You can say it any way you want. <laughs> lipofusin, lipofusin, um, in these other cells that are not brain or heart cells, how would that help me, for instance, um, not have brittle bones or something, you know? How would it... The, well, I can't give you a closed form answer on that, but I can speculate that as certain parts of our body get healthier, they support other parts of our body because okay. there is so much interaction. And right. I'm giving you sort of a hand waving dance around the question arc answer for you. That's fine, thank you. Mm -hmm. Walter? Does the cell ever expel lysosomes? Ah. Uh, Lysosomes. Under certain conditions, it has been reported. Uh, 
Yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, during cell division, it might happen, but that hasn't been reported. Not so much heart. in the brain and the heart, perhaps. Yeah. If at all. I think under certain conditions, it could happen, and that could be. For example, if you look at short-lived animals, like fruit flies and uh, C. elegans worms, they will accumulate as much lipoplasin in their three-week or five-week lifespan as we do in 80 years. So there's there's something going on that we're doing we're doing it pretty good already, and whether it's uh, expelling lipoplasin or just not accumulating it because we've got better enzymes, it's hard to say. But we're already doing a, a darn good job. We just need to make it a little better. Yes. Did you say uh, that you worked at the Office of Technology as? Uh, Assessment? Yes, I worked there from 1976 to 1979. Well, this is a little off the topic, but I was just wondering if you think it was a good idea to defund that, and if not, uh, why should it be brought back? I thought it was an excellent agency because it was governed by both the House and the Senate, and the governing board was 50% Republican and 50% Democrat. And they made a great effort to be non-political in their analyses. And they looked at long-term issues. I thought it was a, a great benefit to the country. And I really wish they would reestablish it. I know um, we can take a 15-minute networking break finish the food, and then come back and <laughs> 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 presentation. So, uh, probably, like, in the meantime, we have DVDs here for those who want to uh, buy them, and a uh, few books on the milk subject, so you can check those. About uh, 15 minutes.